Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Julia Caro, Managing Editor at Gen Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Integration of 3' mRNA-seq and ChIP-seq datasets to disentangle redundant epigenetic regulatory mechanisms. This webinar is sponsored by Lexogen. Our speakers today are Dr. Jorge Cepeda, Application Scientist at Lexogen, and John Lozac, Chief Science Officer at OnRamp Bio. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar, and uh, you can do this through the Q&A panel, which usually appears on the right side of your webinar presentation. And we will ask our speakers your questions after the presentations have concluded. Also, if you look at the bottom tray of your window, you will see a series of widgets that you can use to enhance your webinar experience. So with that, let me turn it over to Jorge. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Alison, uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming. So uh, the main focus on, of this seminar is to showcase a straightforward approach to integrate different genomic data sets to study redundant epigenetic mechanisms. And to illustrate this, we will show a published data set from a recent study that I led at the Institute of Molecular Biotechnology, IMBA, in the lab of Oliver Bell where we couple an inducible protein degradation system to high throughput transcriptional and chromatin profiling in mouse embryonic stem cells. Okay, so first of all, I'll briefly introduce the system that will be the focus of today. This is the polycom system, which is composed of several genes encoding proteins that bear chromatin modifying activities. They are very well conserved from insects to mammals, and they are known to be repressors of developmental genes, as it is exemplified in this picture of a polycom mutant fly that has legs instead of antenna, and extra sex comes in the anterior legs, where here are shown with the black arrows, which are normally only present in the posterior legs, hence the name polycom. Polycom proteins assemble into two main families of multi-subunit complexes the polycover breasted complex one and two, or PRC1 and PRC2. Furthermore, PRC2 catalyzes the trimethylation of histone H3 on lysine 27, H3K27 trimethylation, whereas PRC1 deposits a ubiquitin residue on lysine 119 on histone H2A, referred to as H2A ubiquitination. Furthermore, it is known that PRC1 binds to PRC2 deposited H3K27 trimethylation, thus PRC1 depends to some extent on PRC2 for finding its target genes. Apart from the deposition of, of these histone modifications, which correlate with gene silencing, the polycom proteins are thought to be involved in chromatin compaction and long-range chromatin interaction. However, how exactly the polycom complex achieve silencing is currently unclear. Now, in mammalian genomes, polycom complexes, particularly the PRC1 complex, are quite diverse. Previous research has identified two major classes of PRC1 complexes, the so-called canonical and variant PRC1 complexes. They are composed of distinct, sometimes mutually exclusive subunits that assemble around the common catalytic core subunit, RNF2 or its paralogous ring one. Now, one important consequence of the different subunit composition of these complexes is that depending on the accessory subunits, these complexes will be directed to their target genes in different ways. For instance, canonical PRC1 finds its targets via recognition of PRC2 deposited H3K27 trimethylation, whereas variant PRC1 is targeted via sequence specific binding of certain subunits. This suggests that these two PRC1 complexes could work independently of each other to silence target genes. We use mouse embryonic stem cells as a model system where we previously observed a synthetic lethal interaction between PRC2 core subunit EED and the variant specific, the variant PRC1 specific subunit RYBB. 
In other words, individual loss of PEB and thus PRC2 inactivation or individual loss of ROADP and therefore disruption of variant PRC1 do not affect stem cell identity. However, double knockout of EED and RVVP resulted into loss of cell renewal capacity, which is the hallmark of stem cells to give rise to an indefinite number of daughter cells of the same cell type. This is similar to the reported phenotype of uh, double RNF2 and RIM1, which abolishes all PRC1 function and leads to the repression of lineage-specific target genes and concomitant loss of cell renewal. Taking these results together, we hypothesize that loss of PRC2 and thus canonical PRC1 binding might be compensated by variant PRC1 and vice versa. This redundancy would keep the common target genes silenced in a robust way. To test this hypothesis, we combine conditional and stable genetic perturbations to disentangle the redundancy between PRC2 and variant PRC1. Since we found that double but not single disruption of PRC2 and variant PRC1 to be lethal in embryonic stem cells, we decided to stably disrupt one complex and disrupt the second in a conditionable fashion, such that we could investigate the molecular consequences of acutely depleting both pathways. We utilized the loss of function mutations as a stable approach, and for the conditional part, we employed the auction in oxygen-inducible degrant system. Briefly, this system consists of a degrant tag introduced in both alleles of the endogenous gene of interest. This AID tag will induce rapid degradation of the fusion protein by targeting it to the proteasome only in the presence of the phytohormone auxin, which otherwise has no effect on the cells. We engineered three mouse embryonic stem cell lines to bear conditional and stable genetic perturbations. In this cell line term, DROVP EED null, the DROVP stands for degrant tag ROVP, which corresponds to conditional disruption of variant PRC1. And the EED null part indicates that PRC2 is stably inactive by loss of function mutation in the EED gene. And the same way we generated the DSUC12 RWBP null cell, cell line, where we render PRC2 conditional by tagging SUC12 with the AID degron, while variant PRC1 is stably disrupted by RWBP null curve. Using this approach, we could induce double depletion of PRC2 and variant PRC1 from both directions. As a positive control, we tag RNF2 with AID, hence the DRNF2 side, in the background of its paralog ring one loss of function mutation. In this case, auxin would result into inactivation of all PRC1 complexes. The system works very well, as you can appreciate on this Western blot. We blur it for RNF2 protein, protein here. The band observed in the first and second lane correspond to wild-type RNF2, while the higher molecular band observed on the third and fifth lanes correspond to the AID-tagged versions of RNF2. Importantly here, the AID-RNF2 bands completely disappear upon oxygen treatment, which is indicated with a minus or plus sign on the top of the blood. Next blood. Next blood shows the absence of the RIM1 protein in all cell lines, but the wild type and finally lamin B serves as a loading control. Moreover, we generated two clones per cell line to avoid clonal effects. Now, having established these cell lines, we went on to assess the cellular phenotype of the oxygen mediated double depletions. To that end, we assess ESL colony morphology and pluripotency by alkaline phosphatase staining. Pluripotency is the ability of a cell to develop into the three primary germ layers for which PRC1 function has been shown to be essential in mouse embryonic stem cells. These are light microscopy pictures of two representative ESL colonies grown in medium without oxygen. The blue color depicts the alpha alkaline phosphatase stain. Here, one can appreciate the round dome-like shape typical of normal ESLs whereas the next two pictures correspond to cells grown in the presence of auxin. 
These cells appear fragmented and their individual cells show less staining, consistent with the spontaneous differentiation in exit for, from pluripotency that has been reported on double RIM1 and RNF2 double knockout cells. Then we assayed, next we quantified live cells by flow cytometry, grown in either untreated medium depicted here in green or in medium containing oxygen shown in orange. This assay shows strong proliferation defects as a consequence of the oxygen treatment, which are consistent with the known impaired self-renewal observed upon loss of both RIM1 and RNF2. Then, we assayed in the same way depletion of variant PRC1 on PRC2 inactive cells by treating RWVP EED null cells with auxin, and we can observe similar disrupted colony morphology and diminished alkaline phosphatase staining, as well as similar proliferation defects. These are also recapitulated by depletion of PRC2 on variant PRC1 disrupted cells induced by treating this other cell line with auxin. Now, taking these results together, we conclude that simultaneous but not individual disruption of PRC2 and variant PRC1 result into loss of self-renewal capacity, phenocopying the double loss of RIM1 and RNF2 at the cellular level. And having this system in place, we went ahead to characterize the changes in chromatin structure and gene expression induced by systematic disruption of polygon complexes. To that end, we utilize the chip, we utilize chip seek to assess RNF2 occupancy at promoter regions and to measure the deposition of H2A ubiquitylation, which is a proxy for PRC1 activity and correlates with transcriptional silencing. This provides with a snapshot of the chromatin environment a, a particular given point. In order to link the chromatin level to transcriptional changes, we utilize a variation of normal RNA-seq denominated 3' prime mRNA-seq. Briefly, this technique focuses the sequencing reads on the very 3' prime end of mRNA, as the name suggests, thus drastically reducing the sequencing space required for transcript quantification. This results into more or less 10 times higher multiplexing capacity which allows to include multiple controls and sampling at different time points without ramping up the sequencing costs. Furthermore, this approach is automation friendly, which we exploited by preparing 96 libraries in parallel with the use of an automatic liquid handler, not only saving time, but also making the library possible, uh, process highly reproducible. Now, when it comes to the data analysis part, in particular, the integration of these different types of data set, the most common option is to use ad hoc bioinformatic pipelines, which requires navigating to a couple of different programming languages and several bioinformatic tools. But today, I will show you an alternative approach using the Rosalind Genomics platform. And to that end, we reanalyze the data from the aforementioned experiments on Rosalind, which I'll present in the next few slides. To begin with, we looked at the effects of the auxin treatment on the chromatin-bound RNF2 at promoter regions genome-wide. For this, we performed differential binding analysis on the RNF2 chip seq data. On this, MA, on this MA plot, each dot represents one promoter. The, the y-axis indicates the log to fold change between auxin treated over untreated samples, so the magnitude and direction of the change whereas the x-axis shows the log to normalize peak height, in other words, how much RNF2 was present in the untreated sample. The colors indicate statistically significant promoters that either gain signal in green or lose signal in purple. Thus, from this plot, we can conclude that the auxin treatment leads to massive loss of RNF2 binding at nearly 5,000 promoters in the cell line, where auxin treatment disrupts all PSU one complexes. Again, this is our positive control. When we look at the same analysis on the DRYBPEED null cells, where auxin disrupts variant PRC1 on a PRC2 inactive background, we can see a similar effect, where the great majority of the significant changes correspond to loss of RNF2 binding, even though in this case, we do not degrade RNF2 itself. 
the extent of the effect is not as dramatic as with the DRNF2 ring one null cell, because as you might remember from the introduction, canonical PRC1 is no longer bound to promoters due to the lack of PRC2 deposited H3K27 trimethyl in the cells. Nevertheless, we still see a significant reduction of residual RNF2 binding at around 1,000 promoters. Finally, when we look at the DCC12 RWB null cells where auxin treatment disrupts PRC2 on variant PRC1 inactive cells, we again see a similar scenario where most changes correspond to loss of RNF2 signal. Here, there are more promoters that gain signal compared to the other two cell lines. However, these green promoters are located on the lower side of the peak height, meaning that those regions had low signal to begin with. So even though the fold changes are considerable, the absolute signal would still be low. In any case, both the, lows, the loss and gain of RNF2 binding upon oxygen treatment are consistent with RNF2 targeting defects. Moreover, we performed pathway enrichment analysis on the genes that were, where RNF2 targeting was affected, and we find very similar pathways within the top most significant adjusted p-values in all three cases. The pathways highlighted in blue are common among the three genotypes and are related to either developmental processes or pluripotency. Therefore, this analysis shows the parallel disruption of PRC2 and variant PRC1 impair RNF2 targeting in a comparable manner to double depletion of RIM1 and RNF2. Then we see then we did the same kind of analysis looking at the deposition of H2A ubiquitination as a proxy for PRC1 activity. Here we observe that the effect of oxygen on H2A ubiquitination coincides very well with that of RNF2. H2A ubiquitination signal is decreased on most promoter regions, as depicted here again with purple dots, upon oxygen induced RNF2 degradation in the cells. This is also true for disruption of variant PRC1 on PRC2 inactive cells, as well as on PRC2 disruption on variant PRC1 disrupted cells. Interestingly here, we do not see promoters gaining H2A ubiquitination, despite the fact that in this last cell line, we see 600 promoters gaining RNF2 signal upon oxygen addition, suggesting that this gain of RNF2 might not be functional, at least in the catalytic sense. Therefore, we conclude that deposition of H2A ubiquitination is impaired as a consequence of parallel disruption of PRC2 and variant PRC1, similar to complete inactivation of PRC1. Then we turn to look at gene expression. We did a time course experiment at 6, 24, and 48 hours after oxygen addition and calculated differential gene expression between the treated samples over the untreated controls that were grown, collected, and prepared in parallel. This is illustrated in this heat map where each row depicts a gene. The columns represent a given time point. The color encodes the log fold change between oxygen treated and untreated samples at each time point. Blue means downregulation, whereas orange encodes upregulation. Additionally, the genes clustered according to their gene expression patterns across all time points. These patterns are summarized on the adjacent bar plots. And from these, we can see gradual gene expression changes, which are for the most part upregulation as a consequence of oxygen induced degradation of RNF2 in RIM1 null cells. This is consistent with the reported. Um, global de repression of polycom target genes observed in RIM1 and RNF2 double knockout cells. Now, if we do the same kind of analysis for the DRWP EED null and DCC12 RWP null cells, we see a very similar pattern where, both, when it, where in both cases, roughly two thirds of misexpressed genes are upregulated, similar to complete PRC1 inactivation. Now, let's focus on the 20 uh, on the 48 hour time point here where we observe the the most prominent gene expression changes indeed in this volcano plot each dot represents a gene the x the y axis depicts the significance of the change and the x axis represents the magnitude of the change the purple color again indicates down regulation and the green color represents up regulation 
Here, it is clear that the oxygen-induced degradation of RNF2 in the absence of RIM1 results into thousands of misexpressed genes, out of which the majority are upregulated. Next, we see a similar pattern when we either disrupt variant PRC1 on PRC2 inactive cells or by disrupting PRC2 on variant PRC1 impaired cells. Moreover, when performing pathway enrichment analysis on the differentially expressed genes, we again observe a high concordance of significant pathways that pop up in the three case. Highlighted in blue, you can see gene, uh, you can see pathway, uh, you can see that the genes involved in developmental and pluripotency pathways, very much in agreement with the chip seq and uh, differential binding analysis and consistent with the role of polycom proteins in silencing key developmental regulators and maintaining the pluripotency in embryonic stem cells. Now, so far, we've looked at either the chromatin or gene expression changes individually, but we can go further and combine those data sets in a metaplot analysis. This is illustrated here as a heat map where the first two columns depict the log full changes in H2A ubiquitination and RNF2 after 24 hours of treatment. Here again, each row represents a gene, but this time we are focusing on only the promoters of polycom target genes that are common uh, among PRC2, canonical, and variant PRC1. The next three columns show the gene expression changes for the corresponding genes at 6, 24, and 48 hours of oxygen treatment. By integrating these data sets, we can clearly observe two major patterns emerge. The first shows decreased H2A ubiquitination and RNF2, but no gene expression changes. And the second where H2A ubiquitination and RNF2 decrease is coupled to gradual upregulation of polycom target genes. Then we see the same patterns emerge when disrupting PRC2 and variant PRC1 starting from one or the other direction. This demonstrates a parallel disruption of PRC2 and variant PRC1 phenocopy double depletion of RIM1 and RNF2, not only at the cellular level, but also at the chromatin and transcriptional levels. It is worth noting that the effects observed by EED and RWBP or RWBP and SUSI12 double depletions are less pronounced compared to double depletions of RIM1 and RNF2, most likely because there are many other redundant polycom subunits that can still associate with RIM1 and RNF2 to compensate to some extent. Nevertheless, these effects are enough to trigger loss of cell renewal in mouse embryonic stem cells. Now, we can do the same type of, of meta-analysis, but this time looking at all genes to explore the global consequences of, in this case, complete inactivation of PRC1. In this genome-wide meta-analysis, we can observe two similar patterns emerge where the majority of genes that lose H2A ubiquitination and RNF2 signal remain transcriptionally unchanged, and the smaller subset where the decrease in H2A ubiquitination and RNF2 signal is accompanied with gradual transcriptional upregulation. Furthermore, the results of the pathway analysis Uh, are, are very similar to what we had observed before. However, this time I want to focus on, I want to go deeper into two pathways, namely the heart development and apoptosis pathways. Now, this graph shows the heart development pathway. The genes that participate on it are enclosed in boxes and those colored in green are the genes that are affected across chromatin and transcriptional analysis from the previous metaplot. Then we can pick a gene like FOXA2 and see how we, it was affected in this cell line. In this bar plot, you can see the integrated effects of H2A ubiquitination, RNF2 binding, and gene expression as described in the legends. The dark blue and orange bars represent the average pattern of the group in which they were clustered in and the light bar shows the magnitude of the change at the individual FOXA2 gene across these data sets. We can do this also for the other two cell lines and again see similar pattern of decreased H2A ubiquitination and gradual gene expression. 
So we believe that PRC1 disrupted ES cells lose their self-renewal capacity due to the confounding developmental signals that arise from the repression of hundreds of developmental regulators. But this meta-analysis hints that the apoptosis pathway might also be involved to some extent. Looking at the apoptosis pathway, we see several genes affected by the oxygen-induced PRC1 inactivation, including some caspases. Then we can look at one example, in this case, caspase 7, and we can see that loss of H2A ubiquitinatio coupled to transcriptional upregulation, which is also true for parallel depletion of PRC2 and variant PRC1, as observed in these two additional bar plots. Now, in summary, I have shown you today that simultaneous but not individual disruption of PRC2 and variant PRC1 lead to loss of sovereign oil in mouse embryonic stem cells, that these double disruptions impair RNF2 targeting and H2A ubiquitin deposition. The genes directly affected by these perturbations are involved in developmental and pluripotency pathways, and that parallel disruption of PRC2 and variant PRC1 in both directions phenocopy the complete inactivation of PRC1 at the chromatin and transcriptional levels. Taking all of these results together, we have come to the conclusion that PRC2, canonical PRC1, and variant PRC1 constitute independent pathways that act redundantly to silence lineage-specific genes and safeguard ESL cell renewal capacity in mouse embryonic stem cells. So now I will leave you with Jean, who will give you a demo of Rosalind and showcase how we did this analysis that I just showed. Thank you very much, Jorge. Um, as a quick reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A panel. So um, as Jorge said, our next speaker is Jean Lozac. Please go ahead. Thank you, Julia, for the introduction. Of the figure Jorge used to illustrate the first part of this webinar were produced using our discovery platform, Rosalind. I'm going to show you now how these figures were generated. But let me first tell you a little more about Rosaline. We designed Rosaline to circumvent the data analysis bottleneck, which for experiment and biological insight. Rosaline is designed for biologists. No installation, programming, or bioinformatics skill is required. You set up your analysis in minutes and get your results the same day. It brings you from FASTQ to full interpretation and offers seamless collaboration. Rosaline not only empowers researchers, but also frees up precious time for bioinformatic team. Describing your experiment is the first step of your discovery journey. Rosaline guides you to enter your experiment design from selecting the experiment type, as you can see here, the species and built, the sample and library preparation kit, up to entering your sample metadata and setting up your comparison before asking you to upload your FASTQ. Once the FASTQ are uploaded, the analysis will start automatically and also run a detailed QC. Quality control is the most important step before you explore your result. Rosaline assists you in this task by providing you with an intelligent QC display displaying essential metrics and graphs, but also auto-detecting outlier contamination and much more, so you can trust the result you are about to see. Collaboration is a key component of the researcher life. And before jumping into result exploration, I wanted to show you how Rosaline can help in that area. You can create a collaboration space where you invite participants. This could be your PI, your colleague, your entire team, or a collaborator across the world. All, part all space participants can then share their experiment and analysis and all work at the same time without having to exchange any file. Rosaline maintains an audit trail to ensure all data and results are safely saved in one place, making it easy to capture everyone's contribution. To give you a personal example here, as Rory live in Austria and I'm in California, we created a collaboration space while we were preparing this webinar. It was extremely convenient given the distance and time difference between us. Now let's explore Rory QuantSeq result. Comparing a group of samples is the base of any analysis. Rosaline provides you with a very intuitive interface to set up your comparison using the metadata associated to your sample. 
A few simple drag and drop let you define your condition and control group, and in about 15 minutes bring you to this analysis. You can see here 1,280 genes regulated differentially expressed by plus minus 1.5 fold change with a p-value uh, adjusted smaller than 0.05. Of course, you can define different cutoff. You can don display alternative plot, but more importantly, you can explore the result of enrichment analysis you see on the right side. Rosaline used over 50 pathways, ontology, and other knowledge bases to give you the most accurate interpretation for each comparison. If you want more than just the top five terms you see for each knowledge base, you can click any magnifier glass to see the full list. You can then select any pathway to see the list of differentially expressed genes belonging to this pathway, and ultimately even access an interactive pathway map. You can see here the art development Rory show you in his slide. In his study, Rory follows the oxide mediated degradation of PRC1 and variant PRC, PRC2 and variant PRC1 subunit at 6, 24, and 48 hours. After comparing each time point to the control, the next logical step is to combine this comparison to really observe the transcriptomics changes over time. Rosaline meta-analysis feature allows you to do exactly that. Let me explain in more detail what we are looking at here. On the left side, you find the three comparison we wanted to combine. You can see the 6, 24, and 48 hours. Each column of the heat map corresponds to a comparison, again in order from left to right, 6, 24, and 48 time point. Each line of the heat map is a gene, and the color in each column corresponds to the full change of that gene in the associated comparison. You can see two heat maps corresponding to the two patterns Rosaline unsupervised clustering algorithm identify. You have a set of genes that goes slowly up, and a set of genes that goes slowly down. The bar plot here are, present, are presenting the average level of expression for the gene for each comparison in that pattern. Rosaline already ran the enrichment analysis to annotate each expression pattern with meaningful biological function. You can explore individual pattern. You can select multiple genes as I did here, to see their regulation across the comparison. And of course, you can use all the pathway ontology and other knowledge bases available to understand the function of this gene similarly regulated. Let's now explore the epigenetic data. For epigenetics, Rosaline offers two options to compare your group of samples, peaks overlap and differential binding. Peak overlap performs a genome-wide comparison where you are looking for location across the entire genome where you see differences in epigenetic events like histone modification. Differential binding will focus on these epigenetic differences seen on the proximal promoter of gene only. Let's look first at the result of a peak overlap comparison. Here, we wanted to find all the regions in the genome where was different between the control and the auxin 24-hour treated sample. The Venn diagram shows you in blue the control sample and in orange the treated one. The number in the Venn, pretty small here, but maybe you can read them, um, represents the number of regions in each category. As you can, only a small number of regions are specific to the treated sample. At the top of the page, you can select which part of the Venn diagram you want to focus on, and the rest of the page below will be refreshed accordingly. You find below the top five significant peak, basically region of interest, as a non-motif, followed by the de novo motif enrichment. An enrichment pathway analysis and term has also been run using the gene close by to each identified significant region. You can, of course, expand or download the list of PIC. And if you click on any of them, you will obtain a track plot view of the selected PIC region with a gene model. We have a great example here with a CASP7 gene already mentioned in this slide. You're clearly 
observe the loss of RNF2, loss of occupancy of RNF2 in the promoter region when comparing the auxin 24-hour treated sample on the top to the untreated sample here. We also represent the input sample that was used for normalizing all the chip. Let's, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Let's now look at differential binding comparison using the same chip sample against RNF2 comparing 24-hour auxin treated versus control. At first, apart from the differential binding title on the upper left, it does look like Rosaline regular RNA-seq differential expression page. But how you interpret that page is very different. The gene on the left here are not there because they are differentially expressed, but because their proximal promoter region show a significant difference for RNF2 occupancy when comparing the 24-hour treated sample to the control. The gene at the bottom, CASP7, is the same one I show you on the track plot. We could see then a clear loss of occupancy at 24 hours, and here we can confirm this and even quantify it. It's 22-fold lower. The features on that screen are the same than for RNA-seq. So, for example, you can select a pathway like uh, embryonic stem cell pluripotency pathway to see that 63 genes out of 118 in that pathway were regulated in your comparison, which obviously led to a very significant corrected p-value. You, al you also obtain a custom heat map with only this 63 gene, and you can download, uh, obviously, that heat map. Like before, you can explore the full list of pathways and also get the associated map. Now we have analyzed and explored the ChIP-seq and RNA-seq experiment already did for this paper. Can we and integrate these two very different assay types to gain more knowledge? If you recall, we did use Rosaline meta-analysis feature to explore the RNA-seq time course but meta-analysis also work across assay type. Let's explore how we can set up this multi-omics analysis. any meta-analysis, we just need to select all the comparison we want to compare. Let's start by ChIP-seq for the Eastern modification. We can select the project and the ChIP-seq experiment we want. We can then select the differential binding we are interested in. Very precisely, select any of the filters present for that comparison. You can see here three different uh, filters with their cutoff. Then we go to the second comparison for the ChIP-seq for the RNF2 um, binding, and we do the same selection. We now have the two epigenetic comparison we wanted, and we just need to repeat the same process and select the comparison for the three time point, 6, 24, and 48 hour, for the RNA-seq experiment. Now we have all this comparison together. We just need to name our meta, and that's it. Let's look at the result generated by this meta-analysis. Here also, the screen looks very similar to the RNA-seq time course meta-analysis we did before. But the two first column on the heat map reflect epigenetic changes where the last three are transcriptomic differences. Let me explain how you interpret all this result. Rosaline identified two groups of genes, the one that lose histone modification and RNF2 occupancy. You can see the two blue bars going down here. And then their expression level is going slowly up with time. The second group also lose histone uh, modification and RNF2 occupancy, but show no effect on the gene expression over time whatsoever. Of course, like before, you can explore all the knowledge base Rosalina has to offer. You will see here that both Wikipathway and MSIGDB biological processes find the same significant pathway and they are more reported in this paper. I hope Rory and I were able to convey how easy yet powerful a multi-omics analysis can be. As usual, you will receive a recording of this webinar, but we wanted to go one step further here by also sending you a link to a showcase 
that will give you full access to the data set and all the analysis we presented today. With this link, you will have the opportunity to really explore all the results Rosaline. Thank you all for your attention, and I think we'll be ready for some questions. Thank you, John. So again, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A panel. And also, we would like to ask our attendees to take a very brief moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey and give us your feedback. So with that, let's start with the Q&A. Uh, question for Jorge. That was that came actually in pretty early during your presentation. It was about which software you use to analyze the chip seek data, and I guess that was Rosalind. Um, can you still talk a little bit more about what normalization strategy you used and whether you had replicate samples? Um, yes, uh, we, for all samples we had uh, we had duplicates. For the for the chip seek we had duplicates, and for the chip prime mRNA seek we had uh, triplicates. Um, so, should I talk about what what I use in my paper, or should it should it be more about what Rosalind used uh, for this analysis that we showed? I think the question referred to your paper. It came in around I don't know slide ten to fifteen somewhere around that. Uh, okay. Yes. So um, we used uh, so after so for for mapping we used um, a bow type. So for mapping of the reads, and then for a normalization, um, so we took a, a couple of steps. So first of all, at the at the level of uh, library prep, so after we had done the chips, we barcoded uh, immediately uh, the samples, and and then once they were barcoded, then we pulled them together to go further with the library prep process, such that uh, we would avoid, um, and then we did the PCR amplification at once, such that we would uh, avoid as much as possible differences uh, due to uh, PCR over amplification or under amplification. Then after um, after we mapped the reads uh, with bow tie, then we called peaks and 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 then. And because we know that polycom proteins tend to, they bind to CPG uh, rich uh, regions, which are anyway or picked up uh, by simply uh, randomly sonicating the, the DNA. So this could be a bit confounding in the results. So what we did then, so was after mapping, um, calling peaks, we, uh, and then, so, so those would be basically the signal to so the chip seek signal, and then we use uh, the Deep Tools uh, software. It's a Python tools for chip and RNA seq data analysis. So we use them basically to calculate a normalized coverage uh, across the across the whole gene, uh, and that, so so that would basically sort of normalize away uh, using the input. So where we we had no antibody, basically we would, we would get rid of all of those peaks that come from uh, simply sonicating uh, open chromatin. Uh, and then using the BAM compare tool from uh, Deep Tools, then we generated uh, the coverage. Uh, we generated big, weak coverage files, and then we used those for the quantification. Now, this is actually very different from what Rosalind used, but in the end, we came to the, to the same conclusion. Uh, and for the three prime mRNA seq, uh, we used uh, the slam slam dunk software, uh, which is uh, available uh, on GitHub, uh, because that is particularly um, special for this this type of three prime mRNA seq data. And uh, we had uh, worked in collaboration with the Emetas lab, and they had a very nice annotation of uh, mouse embryonic stem cells that we were working with. So then uh, we had uh, an ad hoc annotation of the three prime ends. And again, this is different to what we did uh, with Rosaline. And again, we came to very much the same conclusions. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of questions for John. Uh, first one, how does Rosalind perform meta-analysis to combine the hundreds of data sets you get from single-cell RNA-seq experiments? 
Yeah, so in, in that example, uh, you know, it was a regular free prime end RNA seq experiment um, done using a Quantic kit. Um, we are releasing um, this week, uh, in fact, a single cell RNA seq pipeline in Rosaline. So we will be able to do that, and uh, uh, you know, we can definitely be contacted to talk about that. But it shouldn't be any problem to do meta analysis in between the different cluster of cell you identify in a single cell RNA seq experiment. Okay, thank you. Um, other question, somebody just wants to ask how they can get access to Rosalind. Can you just say what about that? Yes, it's very um, easy. They can uh, either go to our uh, website on ramp.bio or eventually go directly to uh, create uh, an account in Rosalind by going to rosalind.onramp.bio. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see. Here's a question. I'm not sure if you can actually answer that, but somebody asks how they can use this for chloroplast research, very specific. <laughs> um, I think I can um, eventually answer that if I, if I um, understand what they want to do there. So uh, the research we saw was can obviously cover many species. Um, we have uh, Arbidopsis there, and we could add eventually different plant genome that could be used to do uh, chloroplast research. So I will invite that person to contact us so we can really explore how we can help them out. Great, thank you. Um, another rather specific question, uh, what were your mapping rates for the QuantSeq? Mm. That's mm. a very... So this is a yeah, so I can say from the, um, so, so when we analyzed the data for my paper, so we had over 94, 95% of mapping reads. And this again relates to the fact that we use, uh, so this Lambdunk software with the ad hoc um, three prime M uh, mRNA uh, annotation from the Stefan Ameris's lab. So this actually improved very, very much the mapping rates. Mm -hmm. And to add to um, Rory there, in Rosalind case, you know, um, we use uh, star aligner to do the alignment there, and the alignment rate was over 90%. Okay, thank you. Um, question for John. Can Rosalind analyze other assay types other than RNA-seq and CHIP-seq? Yes, it can. You know, we specialize in transcriptomics and epigenetics, so we obviously cover RNA-seq and chip seq as we mentioned, but we also cover a small RNA as well as ATAC-seq. And we can also perform um, other type of uh, analysis, uh, specifically all the nanostring um, gene target panel. Okay, thank you. Uh, another one for Jorge. Um... The question is, if you use a similar approach where you couple inducible protein degradation to transcriptional profiling, can you identify primary transcriptional targets of regulatory genes or pathways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, this is an interesting question. So I, I think, so here the question is primary targets. So definitely uh, using the uh, co so coupling protein degradation, one can uh, look at uh, direct targets. The problem with direct targets is that uh, in, in order to identify those, one has to be completely sure that those changes came about right after um, the, the, the protein degradation. Now, uh, Quancy uh, by itself or 3 prime mRNA seq by itself cannot do that because with this, we measure uh, RNA steady state levels in, at, at, at any given point. So therefore, when we, already, when we see a gene expression change, it is because uh, there has been a lot of, uh, there has been degradation uh, of the RNA or in, in, in also a transcription of newly transcribed RNA. This can definitely be explored uh, using um, a, a nascent, uh, so if uh, by profiling nascent RNA, for example, by uh, using uh, SLAMSIC, which is a method of uh, metabolic labeling of nascent RNA, in this method, uh, one would incorporate uh, fortha which is a modified uh, 
which is a modified residue that will incorporate only a newly synthesized RNA. So therefore, one can uh, very nicely couple protein degradation uh, to labeling of exactly uh, a, 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 with very high time resolution. And this would actually allow to, and then uh, the readout is uh, is, is read out by a uh, tree prime mRNA seq, so by clone seq. And then in this way, one can really identify the primary effects of a, of a, yeah, the primary effects of degrading XY protein. Uh, so yes, but one needs to add this step of metabolic labeling. Okay, thanks for explaining that. And then another question for you, Jorge. Um, so, three prime mRNA seq has great multiplexing capacity. So, can it be used for high throughput screening of gene fusions that are involved in cancer or other diseases? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, depends. So, I would say yes, but again with the modification. So. Uh, Gene fusions are usually known, or you know, depends. Uh, so, uh, so if the gene fusion, of course, uh, happens at the three prime of a known gene, what could use uh, uh, three prime mRNA seq to identify this? But the way, the better way to do this would be with targeted uh, panel, like with targeted primers that would basically uh, identify the known fusion. If it's a known fusion, so one can define, one can yeah define primer sets that would cover a region uh, that span this, uh, the gene fusion, and then one could use it to multiplex thousands of samples at the same time to identify this. If it is an unknown gene function, but at least one of the interactors is known, one could use a design, a, a design primer that would target the known part of the fusion and then random priming at the other side to identify whatever other interactors, uh, and this would actually give you, um, you know, potentially novel interactor interactors in this way. So this could actually, yes, be used for, for this kind of screenings. But you know, of course, you, one has to do a, a little bit of a modification, uh, and this is uh, so called a uh, quantic flex. This is definitely possible. Okay, thank you. And finally, a question for John. Um, is GSEA available in Rosalind? I understand that's an enrichment analysis. Yes, so it's um, in fact coming very soon. All the enrichment analysis we show you today were done using hypergeometric distribution calculation, uh, but we are adding a GSEA and in fact also GSVA from uh, Broad Institute uh, very shortly. I would expect to have that, um, you know, in in July, most likely. A labels, another level of enrichment and another level of interpretation on the top of what on-ramp uh, Rosalind already offering now. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it looks like this is all the questions we have for today. So with that, let me thank our speakers, Jorge Cepeda and John Lozak, and our sponsor, Lexogen. And as a reminder, please look out for the survey after you log out to provide us with your feedback. Finally, if you missed part of this webinar or you had uh, trouble with the sound, I think a few people had that today, or you would just like to listen to it again, we will send you a link to an archived version that also includes the slides. So with that, thank you very much for attending this genome webinar.